has your week been since winning the Oscar? How could it be anything but great? <laughs> <laughs> it's been phenomenal. Uh, I think, uh, you know, in Pakistan has uh, such little good news to hang on to that it's great that we were able to do this and great to do it with a story that has hope and that portrays to people that Pakistan can solve its own problems if it tries. Um. Okay, to um, begin the conversation, can you tell us the genesis of the project and how you two actually came together to work on this because you never worked together before? That's right. Um, I uh, knew about the phenomena of acid attacks in South Asia and parts of the Muslim world. Really, it's a global phenomena. I wasn't going to just pack my bags and start this film. You always need an entry point as a filmmaker. And so I don't know how many have heard of the the story of Katie Piper, the aspiring model on the streets of London who was attacked by acid. Um, I heard an extended version of her story where she credited her surgeon, Dr. Mohammad Jawad. And when I heard that name, I thought, this doesn't sound very uh, Anglo. And so I called him up at, out of the blue at Chelsea Hospital and said, are you aware of this phenomenon? And he said, indeed I am. I'm Pakistani. I've been going back to my home country to help out. And of course, that's the door opened and I, uh, that much, and I sham, jammed my foot in. Uh, but it became readily apparent uh, on my first trip that I absolutely needed a partner on the ground there, preferably a woman. It just so happens that Pakistan's finest filmmaker is a woman and is, was available and said yes. And that's how we came to work together. And um, what did you know of the asset attack problem when you signed on to this project? I mean, I'd heard about uh, the issue of acid violence, but uh, yeah, I had never really looked into it until Daniel called and uh, asked me to look at uh, some footage that he had shot. And once I saw that, I was compelled, and I felt that I needed to be part of this project, more so because I'm a product of Pakistan. I was I bo born and raised there. Pakistan can produce women like myself and produce women like Zakia and Ruksana. There's a great schizophrenia that goes on in the nation, and it's important for the educated women to be the voice of those who are not able to voice what's happening to them. So help us understand the scale of this kind of violence in Pakistan. Um, while we know that there are a lot of cases that are never reported, um, how widespread is this? And um, is this specific to certain regions or social economic class? It's certainly restricted to a certain region. It's in the Saraiki Belt, which is the southern uh, Punjab, uh, the largest province in terms of density. And um, it's also because the area that these cases are reported from, those are the least educated the highest levels of unemployment, and that is the area where acid is widely available. Now, you don't need a license to buy acid. Acid is used, amongst other things, to clean cotton. If you want to kill a woman, you need to buy a gun. But here, you just go into a shop, buy acid, and throw it. And most times, it's done, the perpetrators are men in the own family. So the his history has shown that they have not been prosecuted because people have not filed cases against them. So it emboldens other people to carry this out. It's uh, pretty incredible that you were able to get some of those perpetrators on camera. I mean, they denied what they did, but um, it's pretty, pretty amazing that they actually spoke on camera. How did you make them speak? Well, Daniel and I, when we were, when we were talking about the film and what we wanted uh, as, as the film, we, we said that it's important to have um, the women's voices, but we must learn about the psyche of the men. What prompts them to do this, and, and how do they view women? You know, because it's only then do you understand what the women are up against. You know, it took all my might not to literally box Ruxana's husband when he said that 99% of women in the Burns ward self-inflict themselves um, with things. I really had to control myself. I remember my cameraman going, please breathe, please breathe. You can't do this. <laughs> but, you know, because from where I come from in Karachi, that kind of mi mindset would get a earful from a woman like me. Um, you know, so, so that has to do a lot with the fact that these men are not educated. It has to do a lot with the fact that these men just feel like this is okay because no one's ever gone to jail for something like this or no one's ever had to serve a sentence for life for something like this. So maybe it's not so, so bad. Mm. Um, in the film, it highlights the work of uh, Dr. Jawad and um, how he worked to 
restore victims' faces and, in a way, their lives. And um, we also see female um, um, lawmakers and uh, (coughs) lawyers working um, for the care and justice of these victims. How important is it for you to bring their stories to the screen? I I think it's desperately needed, and we were aware of that as filmmakers, that um, to dwell in the pathos of this situation would would kind of... would. uh, disenchant the viewer and that we needed to, to find some promise of hope and redemption. Of course, with Jawad, that's obvious. I mean, he, he brings a certain levity to the film with his, with his kind of bravado and his, his psyche. <laughs> but, what, what, you know, but what was immediately apparent to us was the dignity of the women. And then, of course, what happened, which is um, just great for us, but even better for, for the women and for Pakistan, is these serendipitous things started happening while we were shooting, both in terms of the legal case and then, of course, on the macro level in, in the legislature. And so... We were just reactive in that situation to capture that. And um, how difficult um, is it in general for women to come forward to report these cases and seek help? And also, how did you convince them to participate in making this film and reveal their faces? Well, it is difficult for women uh, who have been victims to share their stories because a lot of times the stories are associated with shame. And you find that if the perpetrator is somebody in the family, the family will request that the woman just not say anything about it for fear of bringing shame. And because a lot of these women somehow bizarrely think it's their fault that they had acid thrown on their faces, you know, that's how society has groomed uh, these women. It was hard initially to convince them to... You know, there's one thing about sharing your life, and then there's another thing literally allowing a a camera into the homes, into the villages, into, you know, their their personal space. That was difficult. But I think that they understood. And these women are incredibly brave and resilient. I mean, we were very fortunate to have worked with them because they worked against all odds, and they wanted to be that voice, that conduit that tells people what they go through on a daily basis. And they wanted to be the voice of all those victims who couldn't articulate their story. I'm wondering how dangerous was it for you guys to make this film? And particularly, Shaneen... He's blonde, (laughs) blue-eyed, white. I'm Pakistani. It's not that dangerous for me. Really? As a Pakistani woman trying to make this film, revealing this problem, you didn't think that you could be in danger? You know, I've always felt that being a woman in Pakistan is an asset. Um, I don't think that I've ever been able, the kind of films that I've done, the kind of places I've been, and the kind of people I've spoken to, if I was a man, I would not be sitting here today. And being a woman has really helped me uh, tell my stories and get into the places, because I'm really not much of a threat being a woman. So it's okay. And how was it for you, Daniel, being there and watching all this and making this film as a foreigner? Uh, well, I mean, um, I was usually, I, I was always there with Dr. Jawad, so I was seen as an extension of him, and that made my job easy. But also, um, I, I think that, there, I, I know there's other filmmakers here tonight that I've, I've seen, filmmakers that I know, and that you, you tend to switch off emotionally. You don't necessarily think of the danger, and certainly you don't think of the, just the gut-wrenching stuff that you're filming because all of your faculties are directed towards just keeping the darn camera in focus. And I think that's a, that's a gift, and it's usually in the edit that really we were the most emotionally affected by what we saw because then you can actually emotionally uh, you know, indulge yourself, and, and it's horrific stuff. Well, last year, legislation was passed which would give perpetrators of um, the crime um, from 14 years to a lifetime imprisonment. And um, the law also um, imposes restrictions on the sale and use of assets. It doesn't? No, it it doesn't? doesn't? no because it does. unfortunately that bit did not pass. Oh. And that is what we're working towards now. We're launching an outreach program in Pakistan. And uh, our partners on the ground, Asset Survivors Foundation Pakistan, is hoping that the recognition that this film has got and the, the recognition the women are getting and the issue is getting will allow us to push parliament to, they've passed a bill, which is fantastic, but push it a little bit more to pass something that would allow the sale of a- acid to be regulated. Um, and now with your film winning the Oscar, everyone knows about it. People might not have seen it in Pakistan, but they certainly know about the issues. Um, are you hopeful that um, the, 
the number of such cases would drastically decrease? Well, uh, the film is one component of it, and the educational outreach program that we're about to launch is another component of it. And already people who've seen the film or people who've heard about the film, there are surgeons and you know, uh, people who want to donate and people who want to design campaigns and people across the world who've been writing since the Academy Award. And I can only imagine that on March 8th, when HBO airs the film, uh, you know, that there'll be so many more people who'll be watching the film and who want to contribute in some way. And this, has, this can only be eradicated if there's a concerted effort on all levels of society. Education is key in this because this happens because there's a lack of education, nothing else but a lack of education. Hmm. It, it bears mentioning that uh, we have started the outreach campaign. We have a, a website, savingfacefilm.com, and there's a, uh, although it's not complete, there's a variety of ways for viewers to become engaged um, and to, to help make change. Um, I'm wondering, how has the general public um, reacted to your Oscar win in Pakistan? Daniel? Uh, they're, going, well, they're, going, they're going crazy in Colorado. <laughs> um, Let's just say I'm slightly intimidated about going back home. <laughs> um, it's been phenomenal. Um, you know, of course, there will always be people who will say, well, you're you know, not showing Pakistan's best side, or you know, um, you're not, you're not um, pro pro projecting Pakistan that they'd like projected. But by and large, it's been phenomenal, and there's been a lot of support on the ground. And there's something to be said about who I represent, which is a modern, secular Pakistan, which is a Pakistan that was the founder of Pakistan, Jinnah's vision, uh, and um, standing up in front of millions of people and, and talking about, uh, you know, asking women who are working on the ground, because there are plenty of women in Pakistan who are working for change, saying not to give up on their dreams. There was a specific message there, because we must persevere, and we must continue, and we must win this fight. Well, I think at this point I'm going to open up the discussion to all of you. And we have two mics that can be passed down from the aisles, and I ask that you use them. Um, technicians, can you bring down the front, the, the headlights a little bit? I there can't you go. see. Yes. Um, the one over there. Hi. First of all, congratulations. That was pretty amazing. Um, I just wanted to ask since the law has been passed, have more women come forward to report it and have more men been sentenced to life imprisonment? And has this screened in Pakistan yet? Well, um, since the law passed at the very end of our filming um, and uh, both House, uh, the, the Parliament as well as the Senate had to sign it through. So it's only been a couple of months uh, since that's happened. Uh, there are people who are lobbying for... Um, the cases to reopen, and hopefully that will happen. Um, and, but more women, I feel, and a lot of women who are victims of acid violence have been in touch with Acid Survivors Foundation. They feel somehow they've got a voice, and they feel like they have some sort of power, which I think is incredible. But in answer to your second question, um, our, primary, our first audience is here in North America through HBO. Then we have a UK broadcast on Channel 4. Um, and then we expect a global rollout. Roll There's already a lot of broadcast interest around the world. Of course, Pakistan is our most important audience, but we need to be very careful there. We first need to be assured of all the subjects' safety, and that's what we're working on now before we can release the film there. Yes, in the middle here. Maybe I'll just add one question right now while, while the mic's being passed. Um, Acid attack is not just a problem that happens in Pakistan. It takes place in a lot of other places as well, in India, in Bangladesh, Cambodia, as I understand. And um, so I believe that your film is not just exposing um, the problem in Pakistan, but it's going to have like a wider impact. Yeah. Yeah, I... I um I, th I think uh, it's important to note in all of our ancillary materials that this is not a Pakistani phenomena. It's, it's throughout South Asia. As you mentioned, it's, uh, it's in Cambodia, it's in Uganda. Um, and, of course, we even see the odd uh, acid attack in, in uh, 
Western Europe and here in North America. Um, that kind of explanation of the problem just wasn't germane to this to the conversation in this film, but it's all over all of our our materials. We this is not an expose of a problem in Pakistan; it's a global problem. Yes, congratulations, both. Um, on this very brief film. Um, my question is more about the process of the uh, film. How long did it take you? What was the timeline like? Not and long enough. <laughs> <laughs> and um, also, did things just happen while you were in the process of filming? For insta instance, the legislation and the verdict in uh, Zakia's case. Did you just happen to be you know, doing this? And so basically, like, how long did the whole process take? And you know, were you expecting some of this or did it just happen and you were lucky in terms of telling a story? And second, just a, I was very curious about the name, Saving Face. Did that come out of uh, Javad's soundbite or is that something you had in mind and he said it? Like, how did that work out? Um, well, first of all, in answer to the second question, it was on the first trip uh, during one of uh, Javad's colorful late nights that he mentioned saving his own face and I was like, yes, that's, that's the title. But it took us uh, some roundabout line of questioning throughout the film, and finally in the last interview, he came back, he came back to it. Um, so the, the title came through him, but not with a little bit of prompting from us, which is kind of an answer to the first question, too, that as filmmakers, you have to be both proactive and reactive. I mean, we were very proactive in choosing our characters. Obviously, we knew there was an active legal case with Zakia, and we knew the kind of, the kind of uh, character that she possesses, that, that something good might happen there. But then... The fact that the, the case happened so quickly, um, Charmin was actually incredibly reactive to get up there and to get that filmed. And then, of course, the, the, uh, the case, that's been brewing for years, almost a decade that that legislation has been, some iteration of that legislation has been in the wings. Yeah. It just so happened that it came through while we were shooting. And yeah, we prayed very hard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, over there. Hi. Um, so picking up on that question, I would love to know what all did not make it to the film. Were there other women that you interviewed and other stories that were not as successful or perhaps just ended up ending differently? Uh, yeah, we, we filmed a host of women. None, none as much as Zakia and Roxana because it became so evident that they would be the main subjects. Um, but uh, we, we filmed a number of women's stories. And uh, we also, um, there's, there's even one other organization working on the ground there that we filmed briefly with, but it just became apparent that ASF was the, the most important legitimate organization working with this problem. We found so many of our subjects through them. And uh, so really the form of this film was unusual in that we could see it early in the process. Yes, over there. Hi. Um, so Thursday is International Women's Day, and the United Nations theme this year is about um, female empowerment and um, hun ending hunger and poverty. Based on your time spent in Pakistan and what you know about these women, what is the primary thing do you think they need to have the confidence and the empowerment they need to lift themselves out of these situations? I would say education. Education liberates a woman. Absolutely liberates it. I've seen it in Pakistan. I've seen women who've had the good fortune of getting an education, and when you get an education, you are economically able to support yourself. You can leave a husband. You can leave a family situation. Education can solve all of the women issues in Pakistan. I strongly believe that, having lived and worked there and having met all these women. And I know that if they were educated, they would have had a voice in society. Yes. First of all, congratulations on a uh, really outstanding uh, movie here. Uh, Sharmin, my, my question is that you said in Pakistan, being a woman is being an asset there, that if you were a man, you would be probably sitting here. But I'm wondering, while you were shooting this movie and you were kind of working in an area which was predominantly, you know, had people that were uneducated, I mean, weren't you concerned or scared about the fact somebody may just attack you too? 
this is my light film. I made a film about child suicide bombers <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> this, is, this film is not, was not that difficult to make. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've made some very tough films in Pakistan. And I've lived and worked with the Taliban, which, I, which some would consider the most, you know, hardest uh, penetration in terms of work and access and films. And so, so Sarai Ki Bal to Pakistan was not that hard. <laughs> Yes, someone in the front. I don't know when your film was finished, but could you give us a follow-up on your two main characters and what has happened to the baby? Okay. So, uh, Zakia, um, she is um, trying to find a way to sustain her, her livelihood. She's moved uh, into a home where she's just with her daughter and her son. And um, son has a job now, and we've been in touch ever since. And uh, we've been speaking once a week. And uh, she's aware of uh, the Oscar, and uh, she was most excited. Had no idea what it was, but was most excited. <laughs> um, and then Ruxana, um, you know, the, the night after the, uh, the Oscars, um, I was worried about uh, Ruxana and Zakia because, uh, you know, it's, they, they, want, they, wanted a, they wanted to share their story, but they wanted also to not be in the press so much. But um, I remember that, like, we were, the morning after I got a text message that Ruxana had been on television, some intrepid reporter had found her, and in, in literally in, in a small village, and she was overjoyed. She said, do you know they've dedicated the award to me? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so she was overjoyed, and she was like, I am going to be the voice of all these women who cannot speak out. And I was very proud of her, that, you know, she took that all in her stride, and she was, you know, she literally felt like she had been giving interviews views forever and it was it was incredible to watch that to f watch a woman empower herself through the process of this film we sh well, we should mention that Zakia also has a great deal of anxiety right now yeah. because her case is on appeal and uh, we and and I'm uh, I'll be shameless here we are amassing a war chest to help with her legal fund uh, that's one way um, although there's not a, cl a, a simple click situation if you want to reach out through saving face film.com, uh, that, that we're, we're, we're directly funneling uh, some funds directly to her lawyer so that they can appeal, the, so that they can fight the, the appeal. And I'll also say this, that Ruxana has left her husband, and um, we are working to get her a home and build her a home that will be in her own name. And uh, so hopefully that will happen. I am... Um I'm wondering whether you have considered bringing them to international screenings. We had considered it um, to bring them to the Oscars, but, um, you know, the women, they don't feel that comfortable getting so much exposure, really, and, and they want to have... S the, the parts of Pakistan that they come from, women don't usually speak out as much that they've spoken out, and they, they fear a little bit, and we fear for them a little bit, and we don't want to get them undue, like so much exposure that it becomes difficult for them to lead their, uh, lead their lives in Pakistan. Dr. Jawad, on the other hand. <laughs> yes. Boy, <laughs> who went to the Oscars, and uh, we were afraid that he might uh, bum rush the stage. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, uh, he was absolutely a hit with all the stars, let me just say that. In fact, I remember one evening... Well, he's a plastic um, surgeon. Yeah, in fact, yeah, exactly, exactly. So one evening, the night before the Oscars, we were all standing around, and, and this woman came running up to Dr. Javad, and she's like, what would you do to this face? <laughs> okay, maybe last two questions. One over there, you've been waiting. Hi. Um, so I, I remember you saying that this problem is primarily in the Saraiki belt, um, and I'm just wondering if you know how these national laws passed in Parliament, how well they can actually penetrate into these uh, more rural areas, and if you're worried that, you know, I guess like, you know, more uh, community ways of dealing with problems are going to trump this actual, this law and, and the efficacy of it. Well, the good thing is that a law that women in parliament took a stand 
they heard the testimony of these uh, victims. They drafted a bill. They presented it in Parliament. It was passed unanimously by both men and women, which says a lot. It passed the Parliament as well as the Senate. So at least we've taken the first small step towards rectifying this problem. Um, it will take a long time for it actually to be implemented in the way that Daniel and I hope that it will be implemented. But we are hopeful that if lawmakers took uh, have taken such a stand in terms of drafting a law and getting it passed that they will push for it to get implemented. And you know what? An Oscar will really get the government to push for it. Mm. Actually, uh, Charmaine, when she gets home, is being awarded the country's highest civilian honor. Mm. Which is, which is, but it just goes to show, it just goes to show that that amount of attention with the government now behind it, I mean, with, between our outreach and just uh, the overall sort of ethos created by the film now and the government approaching this problem that, I mean, I've, cre- I've made a lot of social justice films. I've never had the belief that, that, that we could actually eradicate a problem. And it, we're, we feel confident, well, we feel optimistic that that may be possible. Thank you. Hi, uh, congratulations. I wanted to know a little more about the Astrid Survivors Foundation and what it actually does in regards to recidivism because a lot of these women who have been attacked once do have, there is repeat offenses, especially after they've gone through some form of rehabilitation, um, mostly because they do go back home and unfortunately have to live with the people who did this to them. Is there something that they do on the ground to help them? Well, um, Asset Survivors Foundation uh, has a number of counseling sessions and a number of... So it, it, it basically attacks the problems on three fronts. One is medically, um, one is with counseling, and, and the third is trying to find a way to rehabilitate them back into their uh, environment. The thing is that um, these women, in the end, do choose to go back to their families. And the reason they choose to go back to their families is because these are illiterate women who've never known anything but their families. And they have really been made to believe that somehow this was their fault. And so they try and reconcile themselves with the families. There are, of course, a lot of women that uh, uh, Asset Survivors Foundation employs, um, you know, a lot of victims that they employ to work at Asset Survivors Foundation or uh, to be their spokespeople or things like that. But, you know, Ruxana chose to go back to her husband. You know, that was her choice initially. So, you know, that there, there are... It's, it's, not, it's very complicated, and there are very different layers to it. And, and Asset Survivors Foundation wants to uh, enlarge in its, its program. It wants to do a lot more. They have been struggling with funding, and we hope with our outreach program and with the film airing and with our global kind of having it aired in the U.K. and a number of other countries and people rallying behind it, that they will get the necessary funds they need to really implement a robust program on the ground. Thank you very much, and congratulations to both of you. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.